Hello and welcome to Indus News live from Islamabad. I'm Jabhat Hami and these are the headlines. Pakistan's Army Chief General Kamal Javed Bajwa visited the line of control where he was briefed on India's ceasefire violations. The Army Chief instructed the troops to extend all-out support to the local population affected by unprovoked Indian fighting. 18 people have been martyred and 176 wounded in nearly 2,500 ceasefire violations by India this year. In Afghanistan, 15 people died in a stampede outside Pakistan's consulate in Jalalabad as jostling broke out among over 3,000 visa applicants. Over a dozen were injured. Pakistan's foreign ministry has expressed grief over the loss of precious lives. Armenia's Prime Minister Nikol Pashinyan says there is no diplomatic solution to the Nagorno-Karabakh conflict at this stage. Dozens of civilians and hundreds of soldiers have been killed as the fighting continues for the fourth week. The UN Secretary General has called for an end to the police brutality a day after 20 protesters were reportedly shot dead by security forces in Nigeria. Dozens of people were wounded in the shooting at a toll gate in Lagos, the focal point of the two weeks of protests against police brutality. The unrest was sparked by a viral video allegedly showing police officers killing a young man. India has reported over 700 deaths and more than 54,000 infections as the country's caseload approaches 8 million. In neighboring Pakistan, 19 people lost their lives to the virus, pushing the country's death toll to 6,692. Elsewhere, the virus has claimed another 660 lives in Brazil, uh, raising the death toll to over 154,000. Globally, there has been nearly 41 million infections and over a million deaths. And in football, Barcelona have kicked off their Champions League campaign with a comprehensive 5-1 victory over Ferenc Veros at the Camp Nou. Lionel Messi opened the scoring in the 27th minute, after which the Catalans dominated the game till the end. Messi has now become the first player to score in 16 consecutive Champions League seasons. the headlines and detailed stories right after a short break. Stay tuned. Welcome back and now for the news in detail. Pakistan's Army Chief General Kamal Javed Bajwa visited the line of control where he was briefed on India's ceasefire violations. The Army Chief instructed the troops to extend all-out support to the local population affected by unprovoked Indian fighting. He appreciated troops for their operational readiness. 18 people have been martyred and 176 wounded in nearly 2,500 ceasefire violations by India this year. UN Human Rights Chief Michelle Bachelet says Indian laws suppress voices of civil society in the country. Bachelet said these laws are also being used to restrict a foreign funding for non-governmental organizations in India. In a statement, Bachelet appealed to the government of India to safeguard the rights of the NGOs. She criticized the Foreign Contribution Regulation Act as the vaguely worded one. Bachelet said it has been invoked to justify an array of highly intrusive measures. She urged New Delhi to release people charged under the Unlawful Activities Prevention Act. The UN executive said Indian authorities have arrested over 1,500 protesters for simply 
exercising basic human rights. The Taliban have killed at least 17 soldiers during clashes in Afghanistan's northern Takhar province. A spokesman for the governor confirmed the casualties in the Bahrak and Khajagar districts. He said 16 Taliban fighters were also killed during the clashes. Meanwhile, NATO chief Jens Stoltenberg said the Taliban must live up to their commitments and reduce violence for a ceasefire. Stoltenberg was speaking ahead of a NATO defense ministerial meeting. He said they must break all ties with Al-Qaeda and other terrorist groups and negotiate in good faith. In Afghanistan, 15 people died in a stampede outside Pakistan's consulate in Jalalabad as jostling broke out among over 3,000 visa applicants. Officials said 11 of the 15 victims were women and several senior citizens were among more than a dozen injured. Pakistan's foreign ministry has expressed grief over the loss of precious lives. Tens of thousands of Afghans every year travel to neighboring Pakistan to secure medical treatment, education and jobs. Armenia's Prime Minister Nikol Pashinyan says there is no diplomatic solution to the Nagorno-Karabakh conflict at this stage. His comments come after Azerbaijan's President Ilham Aliyev said the conflict could be solved militarily. The statements have increased doubts over efforts by the world leaders to resolve the dispute. Dozens of civilians and hundreds of soldiers have been killed as the fighting over the Nagorno-Karabakh region continues for the fourth week. Azerbaijan claims to have taken control of the multiple territories from the Armenian occupation. Last week, the two countries agreed to a Russia brokered ceasefire, but it could not take hold. The Minsk group involving the United States, France and Russia are spearheading efforts to help implement the truce. In Moscow, the foreign ministers of Azerbaijan and Armenia held separate meetings with their Russian counterpart to discuss the latest situation. They are scheduled to visit the U.S. on Friday for a meeting with the Secretary of State, Mike Pompeo. The U.N. Secretary General has called for an end to police brutality a day after 20 protesters were reportedly shot dead by security forces in Nigeria. In a statement, Guterres called on authorities to hold the perpetrators accountable. The shooting took place at a toll gate in Lagos, the focal point of the two weeks of protests against police brutality. Dozens of people were also wounded in the fighting, prompting authorities to impose a curfew in the area. President Mohamed Buhari has appealed for calm. The unrest was sparked by a viral video allegedly showing police officers killing a young man. The United Nations says warring sides in Libya have agreed to open land and air travel routes between their regions. UN's acting Libya envoy Stephanie Williams said this at a news conference in Geneva. Williams said the GNA and Eastern government have also agreed to avoid any military escalation. The UN envoy said she is quite optimistic that talks between both the sides will lead to a lasting ceasefire. She blamed a foreign interference for intensifying the political crisis in Libya. She said the GNA and the Eastern government in Tobruk have agreed to avoid any mili military escalation. Williams asserted that the resignation of GNA chief Al Sarraj will lead towards democratic elections in the country. The UN envoy said talks between the Libyan rival factions will resume next Friday. Israeli warplanes have carried out air strikes on the central and the southern parts of the Gaza Strip. Israeli army said the strike was a response to a rocket fired from the Palestinian enclave towards Israel. Spokesperson Avaje Adrai said Israeli jets struck an underground facility allegedly belonging to Hamas, but witnesses stated only the agricultural land east of Deir al-Bala city in central Gaza was targeted with three missiles. There were no immediate reports of the casualties. The raid was launched a few hours after Israel said it discovered a tunnel crossing from the Gaza Strip into Israel. 
China, Russia and Iran have called for de-escalation of tensions in the Middle East. Addressing the UN Security Council's ministerial session on the Gulf region, the foreign ministers termed regional peace crucial for the world peace. Russia's foreign minister, Sergei Lavrov, said respect for sovereignty of the states in accordance with the international law is necessary for peace. Iran's foreign minister, Javad Zarif, said the Middle Eastern nations have to decide between being prisoners of the past and a future of peace. He said the U.S. military buildup in the Gulf and arms sales have worsened regional security. Chinese Foreign Minister Wang Yi proposed building a multilateral dialogue platform for the Gulf region. Wang said the platform will ease regional tensions, which is necessary to safeguard the Iran nuclear deal. Thailand's Prime Minister Pariu Chanaucha says he is preparing to lift emergency measures in Bangkok. The measures were imposed to quell a protest demanding the resignation of the Prime Minister and the reforms to the monarchy, but it did little to discourage them. In a pre-recorded speech, Chanaucha said he is making the first move to de-escalate the situation. Protesters accused the Prime Minister of engineering an election last year to keep hold of power he seized in a 2014 coup. The protests have become the biggest challenge to Thailand's establishment in years and have drawn the most open opposition to the monarchy. Japan's Prime Minister Yushihide Suga has opposed any actions that escalate tensions in the South China Sea. At a news conference in Jakarta, Suga said countries in the region must not resort to the use of force. He stressed all sides must seek a peaceful resolution of the disputes according to international law. The Japanese Prime Minister said Tokyo was not aiming for an Asian NATO to contain any specific country. Suga asserted Japan will defend its territory, territorial waters and airspace. The Japanese Premier has completed his first overseas visit to Vietnam and Indonesia aimed at enhancing ties. In Malaysia, the biggest party in the ruling alliance says it supports Prime Minister Mohyuddin Yassin. This comes as a boost for the Premier amid a leadership challenge to his government. Mohyuddin's coalition is unelected but took power in March after the unexpected resignation of his predecessor Mahathir Mohamad. He formed a new alliance with parties that were defeated in a 2018 election. In a statement, the United Mali's national organization said the party has agreed to support Muhyiddin's government. Party President Ahmed Zahid Hamidi said a political ceasefire is needed amid a surge in the coronavirus cases. Opposition leader Anwar Ibrahim claims that he has the parliamentary majority to form a new government. Lebanon's President Michel Lon says he will designate a new Prime Minister who will pull the country out of the financial crisis. Without naming, he said some officials blocked a list of urgent reforms demanded by the foreign donors. Saad al-Hariri is poised to be named as the new Prime Minister at the formal consultations after weeks of wrangling. But he will face major challenges to overcome discord and form a new government that can tackle a deepening meltdown. The president will hold consultations on the 22nd of October with the parliamentary blocs. Turkey says it has killed nine militants of the Kurdistan Workers' Party during a counter-attack in northern Syria. The defense ministry said the militants opened fire with mortars and multi-barrel rocket launchers in its Operation Peace Spring area. In a tweet, the defense ministry said Ankara will not allow the terrorists to disturb peace in northeastern Syria. Peace Spring is one of the three operations launched by Turkey across its border with Syria since 2016. Ankara holds the Kurdistan Workers' Party responsible for the deaths of some 40,000 people in a 30-year terror campaign. More stories to follow over right after a short break. Stay tuned. Welcome back. Pakistan's Prime Minister Imran Khan says the country is headed towards economic recovery. The Prime Minister said the country recorded a current account surplus of $73 million in September. In a tweet, Prime Minister Khan mentioned this raises the current account surplus of the first quarter of 2020 to $792 million. 
The country registered $1,492 million deficit for the same period last year. The Premier said Pakistan's exports grew by 29%, while the remittances increased by 9% in the last month. In Pakistan, coronavirus has claimed 19 more lives, with the death toll rising to 6,692. The health ministry says 660 people tested positive for the virus in the past 24 hours. The ministry said there are over 9,000 active COVID-19 cases in the country. It said out of over 324,000 countrywide cases, more than 308,000 have recovered. The ministry said more than 142,000 cases have been detected in the Sindh province. Well, Punjab has reported around 101,000 cases. In the capital Islamabad, some 18,000 people have been infected. India has reported 717 COVID-19 deaths and over 54,000 infections overnight as the caseload has crossed 7.65 million. COVID-19 has claimed 661 more lives in Brazil, pushing the death toll over 154,000. Globally, the virus has claimed more than 1.12 million lives and infected over 40 million people. More in this report. After weeks of rising cases and warnings in several regions, a second wave of the coronavirus has now firmly taken hold across much of the world. Europe continues to break records as Spain is said to become the first European nation with over one million infections. The number of hospitalizations doubling each week in Belgium. The government has ordered bars and restaurants to close. The United Kingdom has resorted to extraordinary measures in vaccine development as the island nation hit another record high in the daily COVID. COVID-19 infections. However, London's decision to deliberate infecting young volunteers to accelerate the development of a cure has raised concerns with the WHO. What is critical is that if people are considering this, it must be overseen by an ethics committee it, and the volunteers must have full consent and they must select the volunteers in order to minimize their risk uh, because you will be challenging people with a virus that we do not have a treatment for. In Latin America, the total number of infections has passed 10.5 million. Meanwhile, Russia has also reached yet another peak of single-day infections. But fresh restrictions to contain the outbreak in the virus hotspots haven't gone down well with the people. I do not think lockdown will happen, to be frank. It wouldn't be beneficial for authorities. They will need to pay emergency allowance. Much cheaper if people stay home self-isolated. But I do not like that people can get beaten for not wearing masks in public. Meanwhile, New Zealand is once again under the virus radar as 25 new cases were detected overnight. EU member states have reached an agreement to reform the common agricultural policy after two years of discussions. The European Council says the reforms place a greater focus on environmental protection. The talks concluded with an agreement following a proposal by the German agricultural minister, Julia Klockner. Speaking at a press conference, Klockner termed the agreement as a milestone. The proposal will extend a greater level of freedom to member states on how they achieve agreed upon goals. The bloc has set conservation of nature, environmental protection and ensuring food quality as the chief goals. The new reforms will come into effect in 2023 and include a two-year learning period. Five people have been killed in an explosion in Karachi city of Pakistan's southern Sindh province. Rescue officials say 20 others were wounded in the blast that occurred in a multi-story building. Windows of nearby buildings as well as some vehicles were shattered by the explosion. Police say the cause of the blast is not yet known. However, they said gas cylinder may be the cause of the explosion. The United Nations has lamented at the slow pace of the progress in women's rights globally. In the World's Women 2020 report, the UN warned of a further slowdown due to the coronavirus pandemic. The report revealed the situation has not improved in the last 25 years with respect to employment and the domestic violence. It said COVID-19 lockdowns also increased the risk of domestic violence. It noted women were more likely to be infected from COVID-19 
as they constitute 70% of the healthcare workers. Fewer than half of the world's women were employed in the paid labor market in comparison to three quarters of men. Job market participation was particularly low in Asia and Africa, where rates fell below 30%. UN Secretary General Antonio Guterres said no country has achieved gender equality. The death toll from Cambodia's flash floods has risen to 34. The National Committee for the Disaster Management said it evacuated over 37,000 people. The committee added floods have damaged more than 73,000 houses. It mentioned that some 293,000 hectares of farmland have been submerged, affecting more than 300,000 people. It said seasonal rains coupled with tropical storms have inundated 19 out of 25 provinces in the country. In Paraguay, police have seized a record at 2.3 tons of cocaine at a private port near Asuncion. It said the drugs worth $500 million were hidden in six charcoal shipments destined for as well. Two suspects have been arrested. The seizure is the largest cocaine bust in Paraguay. Ethiopia is facing its worst locust invasion in 25 years. It has damaged an estimated 200,000 hectares of land since January, threatening food supplies. Details in this report. Locusts have invaded Ethiopia's farming land. A single square kilometer swarm can eat as much food in a day as 35,000 people, posing a risk to the livelihoods of millions. It is part of a once-in-a-lifetime succession of swarms that have plagued East Africa and the Red Sea region since late 2019. The coronavirus pandemic has exacerbated the crisis this year by disrupting the United Nations Food Agency's supply chain of pesticides. <laughs> My sorghum investment of five hectares of land was dropped by swarm of loctus. I have seven children and five of them go to school. will not be able to either feed them or send them to school after this nightmare. However, the United Nations Food and Agriculture Organization says efforts are being made to fight the invasion. We have quickly moved both government and FAO. Over the weekend, we already brought two air assets that are spraying as we speak. Over 100 field teams are on the ground doing both survey and control operation and additional aircraft and helicopters are on the way between this week and next week. Unusual weather patterns such as heavy rains and floods have worsened the latest swarms spreading across the country. If the crops are devoured, Ethiopia could have another humanitarian disaster on its hands. If the crops are devoured, Ethiopia could have another humanitarian disaster on its hands. According to the UN, the infestation will continue until 2021 in Ethiopia and then the swarms will go to Kenya. In Egypt, archaeologists have discovered more than 80 coffins in the ancient necropolis of Saqqara. The 59 coffins were discovered in August at the UNESCO World Heritage Site south of Cairo. Egypt's Supreme Council of Antiquities Secretary General Mustafa al-Waziri said coffins are about 2,500 years old. Waziri said the coffins are in a better condition than those previously discovered. The discovery showed finely painted sarcophagi as well as a collection of colored and gilded wooden statues. NASA has made history by collecting its first ever sample from an asteroid over 100 million miles from Earth. What in this report? Asteroids are among the leftover debris from the solar system's formation some 4.5 billion years ago. Scientists believe asteroids and comets crashing into early Earth may have delivered organic compounds and water that seeded the planet for life. Atomic level analysis of samples from Bennu asteroid could provide a key evidence to support that hypothesis. NASA launched its minivan-sized OSIRIS-REx spacecraft in 2016 from the Kennedy Space Center, the journey to Bennu. It's just scientifically really exciting. Um, you know, it's the first time that we've, you know, been to the surface, we tried to touch the surface of another solar system object. Um, the first time that NASA has tried to do that and bring, in order to bring back the sample. 
um, you know, in a really long time. Um, and the first time we, the NASA has tried to do it on an asteroid, um, there was a Japanese mission called Hayabusa that did something like this on a different asteroid, a different type of asteroid a, a few years ago. The spacecraft made a four-hour descent towards the rugged surface of the celestial body to collect the sample. It could take up to 10 days to determine if the OSIRIS-REx has achieved its aim to collect at least 60 grams of dirt and gravel. The collected samples are scheduled to land on Earth and cased in a special return capsule in September 2023. More stories to follow right after a short break. Stay tuned. The EU says deal or no deal, the UK must respect the withdrawal agreement. European Union Vice President Maros Shevchovic says Brussels' objective is still to reach a post-Brexit trade deal. Addressing the parliament, Shevchovic stated the EU is committed to reaching an agreement on all aspects of future ties with Britain, but he pointed out the two sides remain far apart on issues of fisheries and level playing field of fair competition. Shevchovic said both the sides will continue to work for a fruitful relationship, but not at any price. The World Economic Forum has warned the rise of machines and automation will eliminate 85 million jobs by 2025. In a report, the WEF says routine or manual jobs in administration and data processing are most a threat of automation. It says the robot revolution will also create 97 million jobs worldwide, but put some communities at risk. The report adds new jobs will emerge in care, big data, and the green economy. It warns the workers now faced a double threat from accelerating automation and the fallout from the COVID-19 recession. It says these two things have deepened inequalities across labor markets and reversed gains in employment. Wall Street stocks have climbed as investors wait for a new fiscal stimulus package currently under review. The surge in the shares of the Facebook alphabet and Twitter lifted the S&P 500 index. The indices of Dow Jones Industrial Average and Nasdaq Composite are trading nearly half percent higher. Meanwhile, the oil prices slipped after a surprise buildup in the U.S. crude stockpiles stirred concerns about a global supply glut. European stocks have slid as renewed optimism about stimulus stocks in the U.S. failed to boost sentiment. Investors have taken a backseat amid new restrictions due to a second wave of COVID-19 in the region. Frankfurt's DAX has plummeted more than 1%. The pan-European stocks 600 shed over 1% with construction stocks falling nearly 2%. London's FTSE plunged over 1.5%, while Italy's FTSE MIB shed over 1%. In Paris, the CAC 40 slipped nearly 1.5%. Earlier, all Asian stocks edged up with the exception of the mainland Chinese bosses. Lionel Messi has become the first player to score in 16 consecutive Champions League seasons. He struck a first half penalty for Barcelona against a Ferenc Veros at the Camp Nou. Only Manchester United's Ryan Giggs has scored in 16 Champions League seasons, but the Welshman's run was not in consecutive years. Meanwhile, Barcelona's 17-year-old Ansu Fati has become the first player under the age of 18 to score two Champions League goals in a game. Messi and Fatih's records were made during Barcelona's 5-1 win over Ferenc Varos on Tuesday. Another better situation from around the globe. That is all for now. For the latest updates, you can follow us on social media at Inistock News.